not always is a good idea, but um, <laughs> all right. So let's just make sure we're looking good. Levels look good. We're technically live. No one's watching, which is good. And hopefully somebody will jump in in a moment. Okay, here we go. All right. Today on the show, our guest is Julia Boland from the Julia Boland team at the Corcoran Group in New York City. Let me tell you more about Julia. Now, for over two decades, Julia has enjoyed a coveted level of success marketing and selling all types of Manhattan real estate from co-ops, condo resales, townho townhomes, and new developments throughout the city. Her deep market knowledge, professional customer service, and marketing skills have garnered consistent referrals and repeat business. While known as a Northern Manhattan expert, Julia also has a long history of selling real estate from Washington Heights through to Tribeca. Uh, by the way, I might be going to the Tribeca Film Festival next year, so I may I may ask for Julia's help there. Uh, sorry for the quick aside there. Let's get back to, to Julia. Nobody cares I'm going to the film festival. Uh, Julia is frequently quoted in the media for her expertise and sought by her clients for her team's outstanding level of service. She proudly represents her NYC colleagues serving on the Rebney Residential Brokerage Division Board of Directors. She's also a member of the New York Residential Agent Con Con Sorry, Con continue. Is it continuum, Julia? I'm sorry. Yes. Continuum. Sorry. I'm going to say that one more time. She is also a member of the New York Residential Agent Continuum, which is a prestigious invitation only group of top agents. In fact, some of them have been on our show and completed the advanced Rebney New York Residential Specialist designation course. Her passion for philanthropy. Her passion for philanthropy is focused on giving back to her community. Julia founded and serves as the president of the Morningside Park Conservancy, a group dedicated to preserving and fostering the natural beauty of one of Manhattan's landmark parks, along with engaging the community. She also serves on the Frederick Douglass Boulevard Alliance Board of Directors, a group dedicated to strengthening the community. And since 2004, Julia has had the, the opportunity to call the beautiful Mount Morris Park section of Harlem home. Please, everyone, follow Julia, and I'm going to give you um, her YouTube, and I want you to find her. Just search for the Boland team, B-O-L-A-N-D. It'll pop right up. Hit the subscribe button. She does really cool stuff on YouTube. Also, by the way, there's a link to her YouTube in the show notes, and please also check out her website, which is the Boland team, N-Y-C, B-O-L-A-N-D, the Boland team, N-Y-C.com. Julia, welcome to the show. DJ, thank you for having me today. I wish I hadn't have stumbled all over some of those big, uh, those big impressive words in your bio, but boy, that is a bio worth reading. And you do so much for the industry. You serve at the local level. You serve your community as well. You serve the, the local realtor community. You serve the the uh, citizens of uh, of New York. And um, I am really, really impressed with as much as you give back. So on behalf of everyone that, that you uh, impact, thank you for being so dedicated to not only your city, but to the industry as well. Um, really impressive. Um, I'm excited though to learn how you got into real estate because you've been doing this about what 20 years now. So tell us um, the story there. Did you always want to be in real estate? Was this like a, a, a career, new career, or how'd you get in? I'm one of those people who actually fell into it. I was recruited. Um, I was working in fashion for Ralph Lauren, and when I lost my job, uh, somebody reached out to me, a friend who I'd gotten to know socially, and she said, I think you should do real estate. I was like, oh, I don't know. She said, no, really, you're meant to do it. And I should have known because when I was seven years old, my favorite thing to do was run down, get the Sunday morning paper and look at the floor plans that they put in the home section. I love it. I love <laughs> it. So, you know, what's so funny is I'm going to have to go back through our old episodes because I am reasonably confident, although my brain is kind of a, a, a mess, uh, uh, my memories are a mess, but I believe there is someone else in New York City who was out, Ralph Lauren, who then left to become a realtor, who's now like a top one percenter. So I'm going to find out who that is because you would certainly know them. I just can't remember off the top of my head, but that isn't, that's amazing. And I'm curious too, because Ralph Lauren is such a respected and top tier brand in in the in the clothing space, of course, and, and other things. They don't just do clothing, obviously, but they are really one of one of the brands that I have always been as a marketer very impressed by. Obviously, it's all marketing with Ralph yes. Lauren, and they they do it better than just about any other clothing uh, manufacturer. Um, 
were there lessons that you took from working at Ralph Lauren that helped you when you transitioned into real estate? Certainly being on the sales side, yes, they were incredibly buttoned up and uh, I learned my spreadsheets inside out and backward. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very, I, yeah, I imagine, you know, when you work, my, my sister worked at L'Oreal in New York for, for many, many years um, and working at firms like L'Oreal, Ralph Lauren, you really learn how these sort of white glove firms do it. And it is about precision. Uh, it's about being prepared. And I imagine that really helped you when you started your real estate practice. But so how did you get started? So someone recruited you and did you start on your own or were you on a team? Like how did it get started? I started off as a lowly assistant and worked my way up. Uh, and after working as a lowly assistant for some time, I realized I was never going to grow on my own underneath the shade of this big oak tree. Uh, so I stayed with the same company, uh, but actually switched locations. And, and that's how I started growing. When you meet new agents now, because you have 20 years of experience and obviously you are, you have your own team now. You guys are crushing it in New York. You have been for a long time. Do you recommend when a new agent starts without experience, um, do you recommend having them having either being an assistant or uh, just out of curiosity, was that, was that a good experience for you? It really depends. You know, honestly, the market has changed so much. I can feel like a granny in my like wheelchair coming. Oh, back when I was a kid. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was a very, very different market um, then. But today it's incredibly competitive. Um, so in being online, video, podcasts like we're doing today allows the top agents who have proven themselves to really capture the share of the, the market. So if you are a new agent, unless you're coming in and you uh, have a huge amount of contacts from another business located in the city with people who will specifically buy or sell with you, I think it can be very hard if you're not on a team because no one necessarily wants to trust you with what could possibly be one of their largest investments unless they know you have the experience. So what I do for agents who join me is I really like to let them grow their business. I'm very big on promoting them and helping them grow their business under my umbrella, but they can always leverage my experience. I have a guy who joined me a year and a half ago. He does that all the time on pitches. He knows he's not up to snuff on a pitch. I come in, I pitch, and then I just, you know, guide him through the process and he's doing a great job. Amazing. And, you know, I, I was just thinking about this. I, I normally forget to say this until the end of the episode, but because we're talking about it, I'm going to say it at the beginning because I think it'll be more effective because not everyone makes it to the end, of course. Julia is uh, has a team. She's with Corcoran in Manhattan, Corcoran Group, rather. Um, I'm sorry, did I say that right? Yeah, the Corcoran Group in, in New York City. Um, and uh, she uh, is is, you know, is always look at her team and possibly, you know, if you are somebody who is looking for a mentor, a coach, um, somebody, maybe the team you're on, or maybe you're an individual practitioner, but maybe the team you're on isn't giving you everything you need, or your brokerage isn't giving you the right training or support. You know, they don't take every agent, obviously, but if you think you could be of service to Julia and you think you guys could have a mutually beneficial relationship, reach out to her because this is an opportunity to work with one of the very top realtors. And I'll just peel back the curtain. I'm going to slightly embarrass Julia just for one second, only because she'd be way too polite to say this, but I'm not too polite. So um, th this is... I've been doing about five, I've done almost 500 episodes of these and mo I love all of my guests. I really do. I'm so honored people come on the show. Julia w is so prepared and I'm not trying to put any pressure on her because it's my job to make Julia, um, you know, to, to make this episode go smoothly. She is so prepared and that is how I, I, I have to assume she prepares for all of her client interactions as well as working with her team. She is the real deal. So if you aren't satisfied and you're in New York and you're an agent, you're not getting what you you need, reach out to her. No guarantee that she'd be a great fit with you, but obviously somebody to reach out to. And she's a heck of a nice person too. So just reach out to her regardless. All right. Back to, back to the cool stuff. Hey, um, can I do a plug for my company? Yes, here? Because please. I love the Corcoran group. Um, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary, five years of, you know, just outstanding excellence. Um, and the reason I love growing my team here is because they do such an amazing job of training new agents. A new agent 
can't even come near me for the first two weeks. Of course they can, I'm joking. But they're in boot camp for two weeks and they're really getting some intensive training that I wouldn't have the time or energy to do. Uh, and that's really one of many reasons I love the Corcoran Group. Yeah, it's it's a great company. Many, many of our guests are Corcoran people, and not one of them has ever said anything like, yeah, not, not so great there. Everyone loves it. So definitely reach out. One of the top white glove firms for sure. So um, we have we have it here in Chicago as well, and all the Corcoran agents I know are awesome here, um, as well as in New York City and everywhere else. They're a great, great company. Um, so reach out to Julia if you're like, hey, maybe uh, this is the year of recruiting, everyone. This is the year of teams. So if you're not like your team or you're not on a team, reach out to Julia. Okay. Um, Julia, I want to talk about, because I think, you know, with all of uh, your pedigree and, and all of the ways you give back, obviously super impressive, but I am always so impressed with realtors in New York City because there's so many things working against realtors in New York City. Number one, cost, obviously. Price is, oh my goodness, obviously crazy. Um, co-ops and having to you know, if, if anyone listening has never dealt with a co-op, most of us probably haven't. That's its own sort sort of crazy that can be a wrinkle in, in a transaction. And it's just a hard city to work in because there's a lot of agents. Everyone's, you know, working on this island trying to, uh, to, to grab market share. And I am really interested on, you know, my, I remember when my sister bought uh, her condo. She was in the West Village. She was lucky enough to get a, a one on Barrow Street, wow. fifth floor walk up. Um, yeah, no, no air conditioning or like a little window unit, little mini fridge. Amazing. You, you, you know these, yeah. Um, and and you know it was it was crazy. And it's really a different experience. And I, I think it's always great to hear how it works in other cities. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the first time buying process in for New Yorkers? Because again, it, it's a different process than it is in most other cities. It is, and I have to say, while I do work with the like total first time home buyer, like we've never bought a home before, I work with a lot of people who have bought and sold multiple properties across the country and they come here and they're just, their mind is blown. They can't believe, you know, <laughs> what's going on here. And my, there's a few favorites. One is I'm not buying a co-op. And then when they realize that 70% of the housing sold your co-ops, so, okay. You're gonna probably buy a co-op. <laughs> yeah, 70% of your choice just went out the window and a lot of the condominiums are new and really expensive. So we get around that. And, you know, co-ops get a bad rap. They're really not that bad. Condos you just have to know what, what you're in for. Yeah. Right. Condos can be owners. And I always say it's like it's building by building. And everybody thinks all co-ops, all condos are the same. Oh, no, 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 no. Because buildings and boards, buildings have their history of when they were built, uh, all their legal structures add to the policies. Uh, and then you have the board and the people who run the building and their policies. So it, it always makes for an interesting transaction. Uh, let's, for anyone out there who's not ever worked with a co-op, the, the sort of the most unique part of a co-op is that because everyone has uh, a, a, an ownership percentage of the entire building, <clears throat> there's, you have to not only qualify for financing with, you know, your lender or, or if you're paying with cash, obviously that's not a factor, but then you have to uh, uh, usually do an interview with the board itself and they have to say, you're exactly the kind of person we want in this building. And there's usually uh, an in-person interview in most, most of the cases. Is that, is that right? I'm going to shed a little light on that because yeah, in New, York, New York city where, um, we have so many rules against discrimination, which is terrific. Uh, and you can really only discriminate on financing. Now, years ago, there was this sort of clubby approach. I think what really confuses people when they go to buy a co-op is the fact that their bank might be willing to give them a mortgage at a certain debt to income rate ratio, but the co-op might require like four or five, 10% less than your bank does. Yeah. And right. so I've had people say to me, but I got a mortgage. I'm like, eh, that doesn't matter. And the other thing is a lot of co-ops want to see that you have money in the bank after you close. And that could be anywhere from 12 to 24 months of your carrying costs, which includes your mortgage and your monthly maintenance. So the other big thing about New York City is to purchase. Chances are good you're going to need a lot more cash than you imagine. Yeah, it's it is it is crazy. So, but it's but it's important to know. So it's it's. I imagine if we were to 
pick you up and pluck you into another city, you would be like, oh, it is so much easier to to get things approved. But I think cutting your teeth in mm-hmm. New York is is really just it's so impressive. Um, let's let's talk about you know how does somebody know when they're in New York when they're ready? Because again, the the financial requirements are are typically more severe than in other cities. Um, how how do you get somebody ready who's renting? How do you sort of get them in a place where they're like, okay, now it's time to, to purchase a property? Well, sometimes I'm talking to people maybe two years before they're ready to buy. Uh, and that's okay, because it's a big transition. And I'm always more than happy to start talking to people and and help them get prepared because what you think you should do and what you actually should do sometimes are different. I'll give you an example. I had a uh, young gentleman on the phone about six months ago and he was concerned about his rental. And he thought that, you know, he should move to save rent. And mind you, he was moving within the same building. But the amount of money that he would have saved with that move versus what he would have spent on brokerage fee, another application, movers, all that. I said, no, stay where you are. Keep working working hard at your job, get a bonus, come back to me. We're going to talk again in six months and we're going to see where the market is. And so he and I will check in every six months to say, is it time? Is it not time? Here are the options. I love willing to say, do this, don't do that based on your experience. I think there's a lot of uh, realtors out there that really try to ride the fence. Like whatever my client wants is, is what I'm going to do. And, and yes, of course you wouldn't serve our clients needs, yeah. but being able, I think as I've gotten older, um, what I look for in all of the service professionals, whether they're doctors or, or accountants or lawyers, whatever, uh, financial advisors, whoever's in my life that I pay a fee to, to help me. I just go, just tell me what to do. Please tell me what to do. And I think that what you just said is, is really profound and not everyone's willing to do that. Well, if you want to move, here's the process. If you want to stay, here's the process. You were like, no, here's my opinion about that. And I think that is so valuable and it's not discussed as much. I think in the real, in in the realtor world is we need to be competent enough to have an opinion. Yes. Um, you know, my, think- my opinion is based on, you know, let's start with what your goals are, what's your reality, and then how do we create together the best strategy for you to be successful? Because let's face it, when you're buying a property and a very expensive one in New York City, you know, right now our medium price is $1.3 million. You want to make sure that you're going at it correctly. Yeah. I, I am curious because you have so much experience. If you were, if, if a brand new agent just newly joined uh, joined your team or or joined you know and came to you and said hey should i do first what would be some of your suggestions about for a new agent or a newer agent that right now we know 2023 is a tough year for agents unless you're a listing agent it is tough and it's even tough if you're a listing agent too but um obviously this is a tricky year with interest rates and inventory, tell a new agent to do, to help build the foundation for, you know, having business success. So the, I, I do this and, the, you know, the first thing I start with is say, okay, let's look at your database. Like everybody needs to know that you're in the business and leverage the Boland team because we have a success track record. This is now your track record that you can market. So we start with that. Uh, so that they tell everybody, um, I tell them video, 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 video. And when you're done, do more video. Uh, And the third thing is get out and do as many open houses as you can because you need to understand the product because what you think is available and what is actually available and the numbers are very different. Uh, And then, you know, frankly, I tell a lot of people on my team, focus on one geographic area. Now, that can be as as big as they want. And I, I don't restrict anybody to a geographic area, certainly. But there's really only so much running around you can do and it can take you over an hour to get from one end of the island to another. That's just not. And you can only know so much too, right? Yeah. There's only so much knowledge to retain. Right. So where do you hang out? What neighborhood do you like? I, I love all. I love that. That Those are really great. You know, it's so funny. I've been doing this show for five or six years now and it's always the fundamentals. And so what Julia just said, it, 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 you know, you might think, oh, I already know that. But of course you know that because it works. It's the fundamentals. Um, 
I wanted to, it's really great stuff. No, so, so let's just recap what, what Julia said. You got to have a database. You got to, you know, get your CRM or whether it's a Google sheet or, or some fancier CRM, get your database put together, make sure everybody on that, on that list knows that you're in the business, create a communication strategy. So they're repeating uh, or they're regularly getting messages from you in some capacity that you are in the business and are looking for business, um, items of value, things like that. And then, uh, of course, specialize, find an area that turns you on that you like, that maybe it's where you live, or maybe it's another area and really just learn that air, that market, you know, and, and be so valuable to people who want to move there that they're going to have to hire you because you know more. Um, I, I wanted to switch gears just for a moment because I, I, uh, being, uh, of service, um, volunteering is very important to me. You dwarf me even in uh, all of the ways in which you give back. And people tell me I do too much. You definitely do too much, but I, but in a good way, of course. I don't mean you do exactly what you want and you're a superstar and, and, and everyone loves you. But I'm curious on, you obviously have a passion for giving back. And I'm curious on why you give back as much as you do and how that has helped not so much get clients because that's not why you do it, but how that's helped you in your business. You know, there's a saying that just rings so true with me, which is givers get. Uh, a lot of times in this business, you can feel like you've knocked your head against a wall and you're not getting anywhere. I'm not getting leads. I'm not getting the clients I need. I'm not getting the deals I need. And I have always found that when I pivot from there to like, okay, who needs me to help them today? Who can I help? Suddenly, you know, I get distracted by giving back. And what do you know? In comes another deal. It is it is interesting how that works, right? And it's like the way that I think about it is, you know, if you just look at it from a purely selfish perspective, because sometimes people go will say to me, "Wow, you you do a lot for others." I'm like, I'm actually kind of doing it for myself because <laughs> it, it it helps others, which I'm grateful for. But I just want to feel proud of myself. So there's this double. There's this sort of many benefits to to being of service. Um, whether and by the way. Most people want to be of service, but most people are busy. They don't have as much uh, going on or they have so much going on that they don't necessarily have time. So when they see people that are volunteering, it, it's always an inspiration. Um, I'm curious, though, because you volunteer a lot within the real estate industry. How has that uh, impacted your you know, your skill set or your ability to be of service to, to your clients? I imagine it's it's only helped you. Yeah, you know, New York City is big and it's complicated. So um, anytime you can expand your knowledge about how the industry works, it's very helpful. And I have learned so much since being on the board of the Real Estate Board of New York, which is only since this January. Uh, and it has really opened my eyes to some great opportunities. I'll give you an example. There's a new website that the Real Estate Board of New York has put together in conjunction with all of the firms here that's called City Snap. Um, many people who are listening across the country might know it as HomeSnap. Yeah. Uh, we have our own version, City Snap, and it's a it's a great product. It's developing. It's new. It, you know, it has some quirks, but they're very open to agents helping them. And I th I think it's really going to be an outstanding resource for all New York City agents. Yeah, it's really exciting. New York is is also doesn't have an MLS, really a, a specific MLS. Oh, do we think that'll ever change? By the way, you are probably in the know. No, that's why we have City Snap. <laughs> that's what I figured you would you would say. Um, but yeah, it, City Snap is very cool. I've looked at it. It's uh, you know New York is special. They have to have their own special thing. Of course they should. Uh, it's it's our our crown jewel of of the country is New York. So, but City Snap is is very is very very cool. But again, it, New York is this is this uh, un unique place where real estate is is very in, in high demand, expensive. Uh, challenging and a lot of, of restrictions and just different ways in which uh, problems can happen. I am curious, how do you handle wrinkles when they come up in a transaction? So I, it's been my understanding from all these interviews I've done that just about every single transaction, something goes wrong at some point in the transaction. So I'm curious, how do you handle that and how do you sort of navigate that with your client? One of the best things that we have after over two decades of being in the industry is 
all these resources. So when something goes wrong, typically we know who to call or we have already given out referrals to our clients for this is the mortgage person I think you should talk to. This is, uh, you know, and we give them a number, but we're only using ones that are vetted that we know don't cause problems because we learned the hard way. <laughs> a lot of times in a transaction, when something goes wrong and it can get hot and heated, I'm thinking of a deal I had a few months ago, you yourself as the agent have to like pull yourself in calm yourself way down and just say to yourself, I might lose this deal. I might make the not make the money and I'm going to let go of that for now because my focus is only to do what's best for my client. And how do I help them through this really turbulent emotional time? Do they need me to give them emotional help? Do they need me to structure the deal different? Like, what do they need from me to help them achieve their goals? And when you take yourself out of it and you take drama out of it, then you can get to the closing table. You just said something very profound, and I want to I want to circle back to it. And you asked a really powerful question. You said when when a wrinkle so a wrinkle happens, some sort of bump in the road in a transaction. And you said, what do my clients need right now to get through this? That is a very, and that could be an emo, like you said, it could be an emotion, mo, mo, emotional support. It could be an actual action that you have to take to make the deal happen. But this idea of what do my clients need is really, I think, the question that top producers ask more than anyone else. It's how do I, not just how do I get the deal closed, not just how do I make this happen and, 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 and you know resolve itself. I want to make sure my clients are getting their needs met, which is really, really the import, most important piece, I think, because I know even as a buyer myself, I mean, I'm a realtor, but I, I don't practice. But even when I bought a property um, uh, recently, I even needed to be talked off the ledge at one oh, point yeah. by someone else. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. And sometimes people just need time and sometimes they need time and an actual deal solution. Uh, and so you have to figure that out. I'm curious, when you have buyers, right now it's it's obviously, well, New York is its own unique sort of, of, of thing, but here in Chicago at least, it is definitely a seller's market, I'm assuming in New York as well. No, no. Um, <laughs> depends, not, not, it depends on your price point. Right, right, of course. Uh, but it's it's a tough year. We we know rates are high, inventory is low. It's a tough tough year. Um, uh, what? How do you? So you let's say you have buyers and maybe the inventory just isn't there right now. There isn't a lot. How are you staying in communication with them during some of the slower times where there just isn't much? To, 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 or, and, and the other question I will ask is also the flip side. When you have a property that isn't selling, it isn't showing, there isn't a lot of activity, how do you sort of manage your way through that to keep those client relationships strong? Wow, you want me to open my whole bag of tricks here. Sorry, that, that's a big question. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so let's start with the buyers. Uh, our, our marketing uh, is, is very consistent. That's something I would tell a new agent is you must be consistent with your marketing. So our monthly newsletter, the Manhattan Minute, goes out in the last week of every month and sort of recapping what has happened, whether it be my latest YouTube uh, video that I think is important for them to hear or new listings we have or an insider tip. And that's one way we stay in touch without bothering them. And then we're very active across our social media channels. And then I'll just reach out and be like, hey, you know, I saw this, which made me think of you, or have you considered X, Y, or Z? And it's you know, an individual approach at that level. And some people, frankly, just need some time. They're busy. A lot of busy people here. I, you know, absolutely. That's such a great answer. I, I, have, I have fantasies of getting a phone call from all these different service professionals in my life going, I was just thinking about you. I have an idea. <laughs> that is like the greatest phone call anybody, at least somebody like me, could receive. And that's always like when you when you get a phone call like that, hey, I was thinking about you. I saw this thing and I I thought maybe you'd find it interesting. That there, I, I can't. I don't know that there's a more flattering phone call than that because it really shows that you care as the agent about their their well-being. 
something uh, about some you're trying to meet their needs. Um, that is, uh, again, very simple and, and uh, easily overlooked sort of uh, the strategy, but I think doing that is critical. I, I, by the way, I never get those phone calls. Like nobody in my life, really. I mean, uh, I was, I had a colonoscopy yesterday, which is always fun. Um, and, uh, and the doctor goes, why are you here? And because I had one like five or six years ago and I go, I don't know. They told me to do it. I just do what I'm told because some, because my doctor said you should go do that. So because he told me what to do, I was like, okay, I'll just do it. My point is, is I, I love being told what to do by professionals and experts. I, not told what to do, but I love ideas. Like, hey, you should go do that. This is this will be of interest to you, as opposed to working at it the other way of like, hey, what you know, I, I, I am your gopher essentially, and I will just go and find whatever you need. I love the fact that you take proactive measures to reach out and say, hey, this this is this is kind of in your in your wheelhouse. So, DJ, I'm going to call you in three months and be like. DJ, I think it's time for you to interview me again. <laughs> That's hey, you know what? You, it'll probably work. And because, <laughs> and by the way, that is how we get guests too. People reach out to us and say those things because look, there there's so much to learn from top producers. But what I I want to ask you, I, I want to switch gears and ask about listing presentations because this is always uh, a common uh, sort of question: is how do I win? A listing presentation and obviously there's no right or wrong answer but what do you do when you're in front assuming that you may be in competition with a few other people who are also vying for that listing what do you think you do that's a little bit unique and special that wins that listing well it's certainly about preparation and the experience of knowing your local market inside out and backward but apart from that especially right now we're asking ourselves like what do sellers need uh, to meet people where they are and what tools do we have? So for example, they might, you know, a seller who has a condo or townhouse, they might need to do a SEMA. And I don't know if we've done the same way in the other, I think in the rest of the country, you can assign a mortgage, you can't hear right. uh, a whole other convoluted thing, but it's a way of helping the buyer save some serious cash. Uh, so that's one example you know we have resources for staging and you know trying to figure out where is the problem before i even list the property and how will i solve it do you tend to think of yourself more as a consultant um who comes in i i you're smiling for anyone listening julia's got a big smile because i i assume that resonated with her so love to hear uh your take on being more of a consultant versus a transaction based uh, realtor I think it's part of my nature, DJ, is, you know, loving to give back to people. I really enjoy helping people and I love hearing about their situations. There's been many times where I've had people on the phone, whether they be friends or in a different part of the country. And I'm more than happy to talk real estate and give them my input. I have one girlfriend. She's never bought and sold in New York. She was in Connecticut. She's in Rhode Island now. And she's always calling me because she remembers the very first phone call when I told her some advice and she followed it and she said, I thought you were crazy, but you were hundred percent correct. It, it is important to have advice for people. I, I think that's uh, sometimes realtors tend to, like I was saying earlier, tend to not want to place their flag in the ground and say, I think you should do X or not do X, Y, or Z. And I think that is so important to have an opinion, to have the facts behind your opinion about why you have that opinion mm -hmm. and be able to communicate that. And that's really what, what everyone looks, we want when we hire a realtor as we want somebody who says, you, you know, this is, this is really the, the right call. This is the best, the best option for you. Um, I, I'm also curious too, when you work with buyers, so what happens when you're working with buyers and the inventory just isn't there? You can't quite find the property. Uh, it's frustrating or you're getting outbid. Um, what are your sort of any sort of strategies for getting uh, bids noticed or, or um, you know, looked at? Obviously, we're a lot of multiple bid situation right now for buyers. So anything, any suggestions you have about getting your offer accepted or noticed that after 20 years, you know, you maybe you do differently today than you did back then? 
Sure. Well, first of all, just bear in mind that um, New York City is not short on inventory like the rest of the country. In fact, we have a two year high as of last quarter. You know, I think we're up to like 7,338 units on the market. Uh, Amazing. Yeah, I know. Under $2 million, or you're talking earlier that different segments of the price points in the market will vary. Under $2 million is actually a little bit short. I'm going to say a little bit short. They had 6% fewer options than they did, you know, the quarter before. So I think once you're working with a buyer and you get a real feel for what they like, sometimes people say, I love this building. You can do things like write a letter to the building, ask the doorman, you know, there's all sorts of things. Certainly when it comes to a bidding war, I'm always trying to talk to the listing broker and really get a deep understanding of what it is the seller needs. Sometimes there's an emotional component. Oh, you know, they, they've loved this home, so they want to know somebody else is going to love it. Sometimes it's just like, show me the money, um, you know, or, um, you know, I've, I've done this a few times, not in this market, but in a hot market, I will put in an offer and say, you know, to the listing broker, yeah, 24 hours, take it or leave it. Uh, love it. And I didn't have the guts to do that maybe even five years ago, but now I will because it's the worst thing that happens. You put in another offer, you claw it back, whatever. <laughs> I like that though, because there is a psychological component to that that creates urgency and also like I'm I have a serious offer. I I'm, I'm gonna put expiration on this. So we because we we need to move, we need to make something happen. So I love I love all of those tips. That was mm -hmm. really, really exceptional. Um curious about staying in touch in between transactions. So you talked about, hey, I send out a monthly newsletter. Um, you know, we're, we're, if, if, I, if I see something that, that maybe reminds me of a client or something that I know they're interested in, I may reach out. But what are you doing to make sure your clients don't forget you? Obviously, nobody can forget you, but let's assume that, you know, people's lives are busy and they might not be thinking real estate all the time. So what are some ways in which your team and, and, your, and your group make sure that these people don't start going, hmm, check out another team. Well, one of the things we, we do is we have a CRM and we have your anniversary date in there. So we'll reach out to you. Uh, but recently, when I say recently, I mean the past year, I created the Harlem Condo Market Report. I live in Harlem. I know it very, very well. I know the history of many of these condos as they've only been built over the past 20 years. And so I will send out a quarterly report that is specific to that neighborhood. I have an agent on my team. He specializes in Washington Heights and Inwood. He does the same thing for that neighborhood. So we are giving them more granular information than they'll get in any company report. And it's just sort of firsthand knowledge about what we're seeing in the market today. And I think that's invaluable to sellers because it gives them you know, a real understanding. Anybody can go online and get an estimate, but you know, they're not, they're not bad, but they're not necessarily accurate because they're not reflecting what's going on today in the buyer's mentality. I think that's really smart. You know, I, I think I think I I think a lot about Zillow because, of course, Zillow is the the predominant website that people use to search for properties in, in this country. And w realtors have a love hate relationship uh, with Zillow, but the Zestimate is people? here to stay. Yeah. No love here. No love. <laughs> so, it, totally understand. And, and I, I totally get that. And, uh, people, that's where people go. So I think that's a huge opportunity for realtors to say, Hey, this is an algorithm that, that spit this out. I want to give you a more precise, uh, uh, you know, estimate on what I think your home based on my 20 years of working this area, because it, the way I always think about it is that's where people are going to look so you need to know what's there, and then you come in and say they're not that accurate. I can give you a better a better estimate. Um, curious I, on on your take on that. I think the spin is a little different, and not not spin from selling it, but the, but sure. the reality. And yes, the algorithms are, are quite good. I am remembering that you know last summer there was a lot of agents who were doing the you know why this estimate is no good. I just sort of feel like you need more. So that might be a baseline, but then let's really delve into the story of the neighborhood, 
what's going on in the neighborhood? What opportunities are coming up? Are they developing the waterfront? Is there a new building plan? Uh, or have people left for a certain reason? Are they building a new transfer station? There's going to be garbage in the neighborhood. So like, these are real life examples yes. of things that, you know, a Zestimate cannot take into account. One trillion percent agree. So this is so critical because yes, any algorithm, uh, uh, you know, AI is is going to you know be able to pump out a lot of uh, this data. Very, it does it already now. So you're right. People can get their estimate by going to Zillow or you know get an email to them or ask. It. They don't necessarily know the direction of where that neighborhood or city or community, it's where you come in and you're like, I know this neighborhood, I know what's coming, I know the history. So how important is it to study and master your chosen area? Is it like, is that something that, that you try to do that every single day you're studying the market? Yes, I, I am pretty much in the market every day. I try to take Saturdays off, <laughs> but yes, we, we are following it with the news. And again, if you if you love what you do, if you're passionate about your neighborhood, if you care about your neighbors and your community, it's sort of easy to stay in touch with what's going on. And you're saying earlier, like, I'm giving back so much. Well, through one of my volunteer opportunities, I just got some amazing information about one of the neighborhoods that I would not have been privy to otherwise. And so that was very helpful. I want to share another story, if you don't mind. Please. I can go off. Of course. Time. So we were talking about giving back earlier. This was about four, maybe five years ago. I was selling a townhouse in my neighborhood. A new ice cream store had opened up and I, I knew it was a mom and pop shop because I knew them and they did homemade ice cream and they have very, very clever names for their ice cream, like chairman of the board. And, you know, and uh, I decided that I would hire them for my open house and it cost me $200. There's nothing. Love and, it and say, okay, you're going to stand out front of the townhouse and we're going to give people free ice cream. But before the open house, I sent out a postcard to all the townhouses in the area and said, come experience the sweet life. It was a very beautiful townhouse. DJ, I had a fellow call me. I think it was like five days later. He said, I have a townhouse. I want you to list it. I said, okay, great. Do you want me to come up? Nope. I want you to list it. I was like, really? He said, yeah, send me the agreement. I'll sign it right away. He was the real deal. And when I finally met him in person and saw that, I said, like, why didn't you even want to meet me? He said, I didn't need to. Everybody else has had their hand out and you were giving. And so I knew I wanted to work with you. Givers get. Everyone, givers get. It is, I mean, so that for $200, uh, that is a pretty amazing return on investment. But again, it's not even about that. It's about providing a service. And also, what a great idea, because for a lot of reasons, everyone likes ice cream, number one. Number two, everyone's nosy and wants to see what their neighbor's place looks like. So that's a brilliant strategy as well, because people want to say, hey, what does is, what is the home look like? And at the same time, it also introduces you to that community and or or, re, or you know it, it expands your knowledge uh, of the of the residents of that community so i love all of that that is so brilliant and you're helping a small business at, at the same time as well yeah and i got another deal out of it buyers who came that day they bought a townhouse from me 3 years later amazing yeah. Amazing. So it, it so it's really about being of service, whether it's to your clients, to the industry, to the community. Um, giving back is is we didn't spend a, enough time on that, I think, today. But I, I really encourage everyone about um, your clients want to see that you contribute to the world, the community, you know, your family, even if it's just within your own family that you contribute to. Wherever you are passionate. Make sure that people can see that that you are a giver because that it's just been the top agents I I have interviewed on the show are are mostly all good uh, good uh, good giver giver backers and that is uh, I think um, a great way to also just immerse yourself give back to the industry because by giving back to the industry you know uh, serving on you know local committees state committees national committees um, you can ab absolutely learn more about this industry that way um curious about where you 
think the market is kind of headed? And I know nobody has a crystal ball, but what are what is your outlook for like the rest of the year in, in New York? Um, how how is the housing market there? Again, it's it's very split. So the um, the second quarter report just came out, and the luxury market is is very strong. We define luxury as five million dollars and above. That's been a strong market. Interestingly, though, above twenty million dollars, which is typically a long billionaire row, has slowed down somewhat. But it's under two million dollars that's getting a hit, and that is because that particular buyer is typically getting a mortgage. Now in New York City, we have a lot of cash deals. I think last quarter is well over 50%. It might've wow. been hovering around 60, 62%. I'm not remembering the precise number, but the ones who do get a mortgage are in the lower end of the range. Now, if you had a, a mortgage at 3.5% and now it's up to 6.5%, you know, that's like $1,500 a month more. That's a, that's a huge jump for the same property. So not only are people staying in their properties, they're not necessarily buying it. But DJ, we also have really high rental prices. And our rental prices went skyrocketing after COVID. You know, in some neighborhoods, they were up 46, 52 percent, which caused a lot of people to move last summer or buy. This year, they're up another 7 percent. Amazing. Wow. So if somebody has the wherewithal, I've seen a lot of families help young buyers uh, get into the market. They're trying to fix their housing costs by not being in the rental trap. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I know I didn't answer your question. And No, no, you did. You, you did. And, and I think it's also, I saw a statistic, um, well, this is many years ago, so I'm more and I can't remember the exact number, but I'll, I'll generalize it. There is something to the effect of about 30% of first time home buyers receive their down payment from their family, um, some, something to that effect, or, or they receive assistance from their family. And that's something that's really important for realtors to, to realize that a lot of, uh, in a lot of cases, um, you know, they get help from families for, for things like down payments. So I think it's, it's a great time right now now to really start and start running the numbers and, and saying, hey, you know, are you looking to buy in, in the next year or two? You know, let's help you chart a path for that if that's a goal of yours. And let's help figure that out because that's really who's up for grabs right now, I think, more than anything is, is first time home buyers. Um, these are the people that haven't don't have an allegiance yet to an agent, um, probably um, will go with whoever, you know, reaches out to them and provides value first. So I think this is uh, curious. Do you do you um, work with renters uh, and, and help them transition to buying? A hundred percent. And we have a very robust program uh, of educating people that are first home, first time home buyers. Last year, we actually had a couple who said, you know, we were going to buy a beach house. Prices have gone up. We can't find what we like for the money. Their son was getting engaged, living in Manhattan, renting. They said, we're just going to do a simple wealth transfer. We're going to help him buy it, gift the money to him, and then he will just enjoy the property, pay the mortgage and the monthly fees, and build equity. Yeah, it's important to really dig into these the, the stories of, of of people and understand you know their situation. I have one final question because you work with developers, and every mm -hmm. realtor wants to work with developers <laughs> for obvious reasons. Now oh. there is no do this, do this, do this, and then you know you'll be selected to represent the next high end development. But if somebody was interested in starting to go down the path of being wanting to be selected for working with developers. Do you have any suggestions about what that path looks like? Well, you do have to understand that at Corcoran, we also have our sister company, Corcoran Sunshine. They are the leading experts in new development marketing. So if you said your passion is new development, then I would say you need to go start out as an admin there and work your way up. Uh, we do have agents who do smaller buildings. Like since coming to Corcoran, I've done smaller buildings. There are pluses and minuses to it. And I would say if you want to do that, develop relationships. There's a guy in my office who's developed a nice relationship with a developer because he started doing TikToks with him and said, I like your building. And he starts That's to do him on TikTok. Yeah. And so he, he does. You can actually... Look, his name is Jordan Silver, and he's got a lot of uh, 
TikTok videos with this guy, Eric Brody, talking about new development. And I think if Eric were, you know, going to hire somebody, it would now be Jordan at this point. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. It, it's a process, and it typically takes years and years to really learn how developers, what developers' needs are, how to speak and communicate with developers. It's it's different. It's a different skill set than working with you know uh, home buyers and sellers, um, but uh, certainly something that people can aspire to. So I love that that they connected on TikTok. What a great idea. So I, I'll plug the development I'm working on right now. And I want to make Please. it very, very clear. Like I'm working with Cork and Sunshine. I am not on site. I'm only there one day a week. I'm like the outside. Uh, what do they call me? The, the independent consultant. It is a gorgeous Robert A. M. Stern designed building in the heart of Columbia University called Claremont Hall. I have been associated with this building in various ways, shapes and form for the past seven years. It is spectacular and I love it. Um, at this point in my career, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to be there full time, but I'm really honored and excited to be there just one day a week. Well, we are so happy that you took time out to be on our show. I want everybody to do two things. I want you to visit. First of all, I want you to see what a good real realtor team website looks like. Go visit the Bolin team, NYC.com, B-O-L-A-N-D. There'll be a link. Sorry, B-O-L-A-N-D, the Bolin team, NYC.com. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the show notes, as well as a link to their YouTube channel, which is the Bolin team. Just do a search for it. You'll find it. Hit the subscribe button. They are Bolin team is doing some really, really cool stuff on video. A lot of shorts, um, which, by the way, can also be on TikTok as well. So there's a lot of cool stuff they're doing with video. And I really want you guys to see, because if you're not doing video, we have... Our attention spans have gotten so low these days that we are only watching. We're not reading anymore, or at least uh, most of us are watching and not reading. So you need to really start doing video. So uh, we have a video series here. Kim Ritberg comes on our, our show once a month to talk about how to do video. So I encourage you guys to listen to those episodes. But we want to thank uh, Julia for being on our, our uh, show today. She is amazing. She's a total pro. Um, if you are a realtor who has clients that are maybe moving in and out of New York City, but you don't practice there, reach out to the Boland uh, team. They are amazing. They will take great care of your client and it could be a great uh, reciprocal referral relationship. So reach out to Julia if you have clients moving uh, to and from New York. And if you are an agent in the New York City area and you want to explore other options, reach out to Julia and her team and see if you would be a good fit. Julia, if somebody wants to work with you, whether they're a buyer, a seller, or an agent, maybe wants to join your team, what's the best way they that they should reach out to you? They can email me at julia.boland at corcoran.com or reach out to me and send a text at 917-690-4861. We will have a link to her text and email in the show notes as well. So reach out to Julia. She's a, an amazingly competent and professional and superstar realtor in New York City. She's awesome. And she also is serving the community, helping keep the real estate community strong. Thank you for your service, uh, Julia, uh, to our the real estate industry in general, and also, of course, for your clients. On behalf of our audience, we say thank you. We appreciate you. We know how busy you are. And on behalf of Julia, Leah and myself, we know how busy all of our listeners are. So thank you for taking time out of your day to listen to our show. And please tell a friend, just think of one other realtor that could use this, uh, the information that Julia provided today. She added a lot of great tips. So please send them a, a link, just one person, find somebody, send them a link to our, our website, keepingitrealpod.com, or have them pull up uh, any podcast app, search for Keeping It Real, hit that subscribe and like button. Julia, thank you so, so much. We will see everybody on the next episode. Thanks, Julia. Thank you, DJ. This is fun.